Okay, cool. Got it. All right, hi there. <laughs> it is good to be here. I love performance anxiety. I haven't had it in a long time. I don't care what you're doing in front of people, you still get that same energy. Um, I was a musician for a long time, and I don't care how many times I performed, you still get that same energy. But after a while, I learned to embrace it because it is truly a drug, an energy that, um, that can be used for good things. You know, there's, there's something to be said about getting together with a group of people and going on a mission, on a like-minded mission. You get a group of people all bound for the glory of God, and there's a lot of advantages. There's something to be said about turning off your phone for a week. Yeah. There's something to be said about getting other people to pay for me to go to a Caribbean island in the middle of the winter. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but as you can see, Haiti, yes, it's a Caribbean island. There are parts that are beautiful. This is the first time in my four years of going that I actually saw something that was really, really beautiful. It was quite amazing. It, yeah, I sent Christy this picture. I was, this is the most relaxed I'd been in a long time. So Dave's going to turn off the first row of lights. So hi, Mom. I'd like to say hi to all the people watching on the Internet, all six of you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Haiti is beautiful. It's an island. It has flowers. It has gorgeous things. I love these flowers. I don't know what they're called, but they were all over the island. But they, too, had a bad secret. Look what's holding up these flowers. That says a lot about Haiti. When I discovered that, I went, you know, that says a lot about, facts. that says a lot about this earth, you know, and what people are up against. Another thing, I like this photo because there's no people in it. But trust me, if you had x-ray vision, there are dozens of people living behind these walls. That's just the way Port-au-Prince in Haiti is. Everywhere you go, there's a lot of trash. There is no waste management. That people just dump their trash however they can, and a lot of it is burning. It adds to the pollution of this, <laughs> of this beautiful island. It is terribly air polluted. But I don't care. Even with all this it is up against it, God gives us this. Beautiful souls, I know what you're looking at. Beautiful souls that through no fault of theirs, they didn't choose where they were born. I know as a fact, I did not choose my parents. I did not choose where I would be. And yet, through this precious souls, oh, these are all kids that are in the program that have been given a chance because somebody went to a Church of Christ in Connecticut 25 years ago and said, can you come to Haiti and see what we could do? Beautiful souls. You will see lots and lots of pictures that I took this year. These are my friends. A lot of them know my name. And I know a lot of theirs. These are two orphans um, at the Cazo Orphanage. These orphans are better off than a lot of kids in Haiti. They have security. They have safety in places where they're going to sleep. They have the knowledge of God and the love of Jesus with them. They have been taught that. They're not just warehousing kids. They're not just putting kids in school. They get a full Bible upbringing and morality added to their education. All right. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called a little child to him and said, Place the child among them and said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Sounds kind of important, doesn't it? Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes such, welcomes a chi such child in my name welcomes me. To me, that is amazing right there. But there also there's a caveat with it too. If anyone, and I mean anyone, causes these little ones to stumble, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the depths of the ocean. Now, I used to think this was not enough. But then I realized, oh, that's just the beginning of this person's problems. God will take care of it. You, you mess with a child, 
you don't get away with it. Okay, I'm obviously I'm not going to Haiti by myself. You just don't do that. There's this is the group, Hope for Haiti's Children. 25 years ago, a congregation of 80 people in Connecticut decided they could do something about it. They got help. They started with 13 children at the Cazot 28 Church of Christ. 13 children. Now they're well over 2,000 children in 25 years. Okay, Haiti. By all metrics, it is the poorest country in the northern hemisphere. That means north of the equator. That's a lot. Population about 11 million. Half of the population of Haiti is under 21. Think about that. 44% under the age of 18. That tells you it's hard to grow old in Haiti. It is a hard life. Medical reason, for every 10,000 people, there's one doctor. A lot of people go their entire life and never see a doctor. This is where you guys have helped. All right, a little geography real quick. Um, this is the United States. You see Florida. Oh, I got a B pointer here. This is Florida, Cuba. This is Haiti right here. Haiti shares the island of Hispanola with the Dominican Republic. On one half, they speak Spanish, the Dominican Republic. On the other half, they speak Haitian Creole, which is sort of a French. Um, there is, right through here, there is an earthquake fault, a fault line that runs all the way through here. In fact, they had an earthquake right here in Jamaica um, about two weeks ago, that it was felt in Miami. But earthquakes are going to happen. Um, you can see close up, here's the Dominican Republic. This is Haiti. Haiti is described as a, a lobster claw. As you can see the shape that it has. This is the picture of a map. We are in Port-au-Prince. This is the big city, a city of about 4 million people, they think. They don't really know. And we were here, and we will end up here at the top, and we'll go over here to a place called Tomazo for different clinics. I do have to take a minute to brag about Hope for Haiti's children and the charity that they are. They are the highest rated charity that you can find as far as their transparency. I'll be honest about a charity. I was once home many, many years ago. Um, I was recovering from surgery. I was just high on painkillers, hanging out on the couch. The phone rings. It's the Police Athletic League asking for money. They used to be notorious, calling all the time. PAL, you see their, their bumper stickers. Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm bored and I have time. I just talked to the guy, I talked to the guy, but I asked him a question. I asked him, if I give you a dollar, how much of that dollar will actually go to the children of the Police Athletic League? And he was kind of taken aback by it. He said, let me put you on hold. True story. He put me on hold and he came back a couple of minutes later and he says, 10 cents. 10 cents out of every dollar that I would give to that particular charity would go to kids. The rest goes to the people who administrate it, the people who ask for money. That's true. Hope for Haiti, that's not true at all. <laughs> out of, first of all, they've had the highest ratings um, out of like, almost like 18,000 charities. This is a company called Charity Navigator. Um, they, they judge. Hope for Haiti's children, I know you can't read this, Hope for Haiti's children has got a 100 out of 100 possible score. And they've done that for five years in a row. Out of the thousands of charities, there are seven companies that have done that. And they are one of them. This is a Church of Christ charity, but even if it wasn't, you can believe that it's being done right and all for the glory of God. Which, I didn't even know that before I started working with them. Basically, they have, they have 10 schools, and these schools are held in Church of Christ buildings. You have Cité Soleil, which I will talk about later, Delmas 28, which is where we had five days of the clinic, and Cazo, which is where they have one of the orphanages. You also have Dubuisson, Mirabale, and Pajest, all out in the country. And then Brajiwa, Robert, and Hinch are way up in the mountains. But these are a chance to reach not only people through the Church of Christ, but to give at least kids a chance at an education and a Christian upbringing. They also 
Hope for Haiti's children, every year they have, oh, there, there are congregations all over the East Coast that spend a lot of time making these Christmas boxes. Every kid will get a Christmas box, whether they are sponsored or unsponsored. And last year they made about 2,400 of them. And they shipped them down there. And the cool thing is, because they've been a charity for so long, they get all this shipped down for free. The Air Force puts them on a big C-130 and flies them down there for free. This is one of the orphanages that they have, and it, it is a Christian orphanage. These kids are taught the love of God. They are not just warehoused. They are active members of the church. This is one of their brochures from um, probably four years ago. That's actually me right there at the back. Um, this is Chris Comfort with one of his several children that they sponsor. Um, and you can see medical. Um, they have an eye doctor. We do a lot of things with that. This is the building, um, Delmas 28 Church of Christ. It is a magnificent facility they have built. It is huge. It is three stories. This is not what it always looked like. This is the original building. It's kind of a fuzzy picture, I know, but this was the original building, what it looked like. They were still building the third and fourth floor. And then on January 12, 2010, this happened. Messed that country up, put it back to the stone ages, I kid you not. Now, you see this door right here? This is actually the middle door right here. So if you look and you see this hump right here on the roof, that's where the podium is. That's where the communion trays were. I got a chill when I found this out and I touched these trays, but that earthquake did not damage the podium and it didn't touch the communion trays. There were over 30 lives lost in this building. They had a, a nursing school that was completely wiped out. But at the same time, there was a guy on top that rode the whole thing down and lived to tell about it. Can you imagine that journey? What that must have sounded like and that feeling and the dust and the noise and the, uh, yeah, <laughs> he had a lot to be thankful. And another thing happened when this building fell. The members of the church showed up at the building to help rebuild it almost immediately. And the neighbors are asking, what are you doing? You're supposed to be with your family. And of course the answer is, we are with our family. Neighbors took notice of that. Family in Haiti is everything. Because, you know, there's no government help. You are on your own. And so it's a family unit. Um, a couple years ago, we were at the Cazot Orphanage. And, of course, we always attract attention. A bunch of white people in a yellow bus in a black nation. We attract attention. People come over and say, you know, what are you doing? And, and the answer is, of course, well, we're here, here to help the orphans. We're here for a medical mission. And the response stunned me. People outside asked, why would you help the orphans? They're nobody. They don't belong to anybody. And of course, the answer is, oh, they do belong to somebody. These precious kids are God's children. You know, absolutely. But if family is everything, I just, it, it's amazing how that works. Okay. If you look, this is still the front of the building. I'll, I got to show you something that is really amazing. If you look right here, you can see where the sidewalk kind of cuts back in. And this sidewalk is new. And this sidewalk in front of the building is really old. Now, here's a little close up. You can see just it, the way that works. After the earthquake, they had a lot of money come in. The Clinton money, Clinton Foundation, they had a ton of money. One of the things they decided they needed to do with that money is make an overpass, okay? You can see that at the bottom of this, bottom of this hill has a little hump. Um, it is a major intersection between two streets in a major city. Okay, I'll give you that. But in order to do that, they had to widen the street, okay? So they had to make room for this, you know, four lanes going up, but then they had to widen the street for the people to go down and then be able to turn and go underneath the underpass. So what do they do? They show up one day with wrecking ball and, you know, dump trucks. This is what the government does. And they just start pounding on buildings, okay? They start and they work their way up and they just start pounding on buildings to make room for this widening of the project here. If I zoom in one more time, 
you can see where this building has been actually repaired. It's been chopped up and repaired right here. They never even repaired it. The only reason I took this picture is I, caught, I, I noticed this kid out here really early in the morning. And look, there's no fence. There's no barrier. Do you think the kid's going to fall off? The kid's fine. But back to my story. Elders and deacons found out that this was happening. Kids, I kid you not, they were so proud of this. They showed up at the building, and it was described as armed with a bunch of shotguns in front of their building. Norm can tell you about protecting a building. <laughs> yeah. Guess who won the battle? Welcome to the Church of Christ. <laughs> so they, that, uh, they were so proud telling that story. That's something I learned. I thought that was really a cool thing. But anyway, every morning, every morning before we would start, whether we were going to church, where we were going to clinic, what we were doing, we would get together and we would have you know, a meeting. We would have scripture. We would have song. We would have prayer. The very first day we did this, this is Sunday morning before we go to church, I heard a proverb that just, it still spins around in my head. And proverb, would, proverb went like this. The stone in the river cannot comprehend the misery of the stone in the hot sun. Something very simple. The rock in the water cannot comprehend the misery of the stone in the hot sun. As much as I try to tell you what these people are going through, we can't really know. I've been there. I've smelled it. I've tasted it. I've seen it. And I really cannot imagine what they go through on a daily basis. All right. Sunday morning, we're getting ready to go to church. By the way, every, every stitch of clothes that you see, you won't see again because I leave them there. We're rich, you know. I have a closet full. It's a little lighter after four years of doing this, but it doesn't matter because it's just blessing. I love this congregation. I do. It's a concrete building with a low ceiling, and the singing is awesome. It is so amazing. As you can see, there's balloons and stuff. They had a wedding the day before. <laughs> so the, it was, they just left the decorations on there. Last year when I sat down, I went off and sat to the side because I really want to hear the, the singing. When I sat down, two little girls just came immediately and sat next to me. It really choked me up, the way the little girl just sat next to me and was staring at me. Oh, they obviously rem remembered me from the previous year, and it just blew me away. Uh, you can see, I'm, I was really choked up just, just from the love. I really was. This year, it was boys when I sat down. I, I really enjoyed it. It's kind of neat. Um, and the boys, they, they know me. They recognize me. And even if they didn't, it's fun. You see how close they're sitting? All these photos, they're there is no personal space. Um, that just doesn't exist in Haiti. When men shake your hand, they look you in the eye and they hold your hand because they want to talk to you. And it's something you really have to get used to because, you know, as men, we don't do that. Uh, you know, hey, uh, we're done. I made every make eye contact when I shake your hand. But in Haiti, they want to they hear what you have to say. They want to get next to you. They really, so all these photos you'll see, there's no space in between people. <laughs> More beautiful boys. Uh, I hate being a distraction in church. I really do. But when this kid saw me, this is Mark, and he knew me, and he, he couldn't quit looking because he, I, I, I know it was the hair. I looked a little different, but he immediately knew who I was, and he just kept staring. I was like, no, turn around. Pay attention. But, you know, it was fun being a distraction, I guess. All right. Yep, that's him. The kid had grown like a weed. I kid you not, he grew probably at least that much. So in a poverty-stricken, if you can grow that much in a year, that's really a good thing. All right. Of course, before, before church service, we went to Sunday school. And that was kind of cool, too. I really enjoyed it. I've had the opportunity to teach kids. And it's kind of fun to work out that rhythm between you and the interpreter because you really get to think what you're going to say before you do it. And you say it in little short bursts. So it's kind of fun. But the kids... Man, they're just, just precious souls, and they really are interested in what you have to say. We were so busy this year that right after service, we basically ate our own lunches that we'd brought, changed clothes, and started a clinic that Sunday afternoon. We had to do this for six days. So basically, we started a clinic right after church that afternoon, and we saw all the kids from the orphanage, and it was kind of fun. Um, this is the registration desk where everything would start. 
And you can see in the background, this is my little flash unit and a backdrop and such. This is me taking pictures right there. Um, that's Marsoul, our, uh, our, our interpreter, which I had an interpreter for one day. They found out I didn't really need one because <laughs> I could communicate enough with the kids that I, I just didn't need one. But um, I took lots of pictures, let me tell you. I took the photographs of 997 kids over, over the days, <laughs> the week that I was there. And lots of pictures, I mean just souls, just precious, precious people. Every, every one of them. 997 kids. <laughs> All right, this is my little helper. This is Shamia. Um, her mom worked at the registration desk, so she was there almost the whole time. I, I really got to love this little girl. She would want to approve all my photos. I'd take it, she'd want to look at it, she'd say, good. So it, it was having her here. And you know me and kids, come on. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I, she even knew what, I could put her in front of the camera and say, work it, girl, and she knew what that meant. So. <laughs> So yeah, she was, a, she was a treat to have around and just another, another one of God's precious souls. This really fried, uh, I was really surprised by this. Um, this is the only picture I took of me showing, every time I'd take a picture of the kid, I would show it to him because I wanted them to see it. And this kid let off a squeal that I just cannot describe. I don't know if it was the first time he'd ever seen himself in a photograph, but he just squealed and this made me laugh a lot. If you notice right here, there's a bunch of kids uh, they would line them up, they, about 12 or 15 at a time, just on the other side of the bench. And when I say a bench, that's a church pew, people, okay? And you were talking about long services this morning, preacher, man. Service is two hours long, you know? I mean, yeah, there's some stand up and sit down along, but, but yeah, that's, that's at one by 12, okay? <laughs> when it comes down to it. But um, I got to interact a lot with the kids that are back here. I've sort of a... Well, not sort of. I have a really rubber face, and I can make a lot of funny faces and, and get the kid's reaction. And sometimes it was really kind of cool. I would ask him to give it back. So, <laughs> so playing with the kids, I've, I didn't always photograph it, but sometimes I did. They would just see what, they would really be into it. It was kind of fun. Everywhere I'd go, man, I'd try to make them, make them with the funny faces. I took so many selfies because the kids want to see them. They really do. Uh, these two brothers here. I took a picture just like this, where I had shorter hair last year, uh, just, and I gave them a copy of it, so Lord willing, they'll get a copy of this photograph next year. They were really surprised that I did that. <laughs> you can't see it, but that's Tanya Hunt in the, in the middle there. But the kids are so, it, when you take their picture, they want to see them, and that's what happens. When I mentioned no personal space, I mean, it, it really freaked me out the first year. It really did. But I learned to embrace it now. And you, know, you almost get claustrophobic when you have so many kids around you, but it's all for God. And it's the wonderful thing to have. All right, these kids here, they're from Cite Soleil. Now, Cite Soleil, well, let me back up a little bit. You notice the kids sleeping. And the interview is where you find out a lot about the kids. Now, one of the questions they might ask is, where did you sleep last night? That might seem like a strange question, but some of the answers this year was under the bed, and it came from these kids. They slept under the bed because they heard gunshots outside their window, and they didn't have that security, and the only place they felt safe was under their bed, because they live in Cité Soleil. And I pulled this right off of Wikipedia, so I can't make this up in the underlying stuff, whatever. Cité Soleil. It's in a beautiful area right by the ocean. An extremely impoverished and densely populated commune located in Port-au-Prince. Cité Soleil originally developed as a shanty town. This happened after the earthquake. And grew to an estimated 200 to 400,000 residents. They don't really know how many are there. But the area is generally regarded as the poorest and the most dangerous areas in our western hemisphere. And the biggest slum north of the equator. And yet you have these kids that are just beautiful. So I, I cannot blame this kid for sleeping. I don't know what he's went through. Remember, the stone in the water. Cannot imagine the stone in the sun. Have no idea. This is Cite Soleil right here. 
when they wanted to build a school here, first of all, they had to pay a gang. They had to get permission from a gang. The Haitian word for gang is cartel. <laughs> that says you something. They paid a gang, and then they got the local government to give them, I think it's like 15 acres. 15 acres on an island is huge. Okay, but this 15 acres was a city dump. This 15 acres was a temporary morgue. There were bodies in those 15 acres. Okay? But so what? God gave an opening in the poorest neighborhood in the world for a church of Christ to be built, for a school to be built, for kids to have a chance. God is good. Bon die c'est bon is how you say it in Haitian Creole. God is good. Yep. Okay. Part of the medical, we keep track of you know, weight and height. That's just a basic fact you want to know about a child. Is he growing? Is she growing? Are they developing right? So everybody gets weighed. This is part of the interview process where you learn so much about kids. This is what I did my first year. I did not go as a photographer the first year. But you really learn a lot about the kids. One of the girls, this is not her, I, but one of the girls was complaining about feeling faint and not feeling very good. And after, through the interview process, when's the last time you ate? Two days ago. Two whole days ago. She hadn't eaten anything since then. When the kids come into the clinic, we give them a pack of crackers and some stuff to eat immediately, mostly just to keep them occupied. Did you eat that? She says, no. Why did you not eat that? Because my family has not eaten either in two days. They get her a bunch of food, and they say, if we give you a bunch of food to take to your family, will you eat food now? And she said, yes. They are so strong with the family. One time, one time I was out uh, this year, um, walking up, not outside the orphanage, but I was just at the edge talking to the people who were outside, the kids, and I was handed out candy. And I gave a kid one, and no, he says, toi. Toi, he's asking for three. And you know why? because he had a brother and a sister. So I only had one. I told him, you hold on, mister. And I went back. I came back with six. So the family is so strong there. More of the interview. This is the way I found the kid that Christy and I sponsor. I said, the first unsponsored kid that comes through, I'm going to snag. That's what happened here. This man and his family, they already sponsored three more. They decided they could sponsor a fourth kid. And the first girl that came through, that's what happened. That girl knows her future. She knows what it means to be a part of the program. After they go through the interview, they start the medical thing with nurses. This young lady right here, she's been through the program. She has had a sponsor. She's a full-blown nurse. She's now giving back. She took two weeks of her personal time from her job. She doesn't need an interpreter because she's given back now. That's the beauty of this thing after you see it growing and growing. <clears throat> I don't usually pose pictures, but they were bored and we were waiting for kids to show up. So these, these are the nursing staff right here. Um, there was two teenagers that were there. They, um, one came with his mom, one came with his mom and dad. <laughs> there's no laws in Haiti. I could set up shop as a doctor and there's nothing they could do about it. I could, there's, there's no laws whatsoever, so we had the kids doing medical stuff, you know, but there was nothing against it. So. But it was kind of fun watching them work and watching the kids, you know, getting such an early start. A lot of thorough nursing. Oh, one thing I wanted to show you, I'll back up here. If you noticed up in the corner here, that's actually an air conditioning unit, but they wouldn't turn them on. You know why? For one thing, it's winter. I don't care if it's 88 degrees outside, it's winter in Haiti. And Haitians do not like to be cold. They absolutely do not like to be cold. They don't drink cold stuff. They just don't. <laughs> so I'll get to that later. All right. It looks like he's hurting. You know what it is? It's a cold stethoscope is all it is. And it looks like he's getting a shot. No, it's just a little cold, but he hated it. All right. My man Melchizedek, Valet Melchizedek. Look at him, he comes in strutting in about 4 o'clock to get his photo crack, and he's wearing a hoodie, and he's not even sweating. By the way, him and I are friends on Facebook and have been for a couple of years, so it's good to see you. Good to see you, Valet. All right, I skipped one here. 
Yep. Now we're at the doctors. People with the Church of Christ connections, they know that this is coming. And a lot of mothers will bring their, their kids. Now, this girl was sick, you can tell. She just looks horrible. But she has ex to, access to a doctor, to medicines. And that would not happen without the support of this Hope for Hades Children once a year medical clinic. Uh, here's, here's another woman. This, this kid's not in the program yet. He's too young, but she was able to see a doctor. The guy in the T-shirt with the phone and the stethoscope, that's Jeff. Jeff John. He also has been in the program. He's a first-year medical student. Actually, second-year medical student. You see the phone in his hand. That's Google Translate. He was working with Chris really good about medical terms and what Chris was saying, and he really was just like a sponge, you know, absorbing all this, all this wealth of information. Sometimes medical doesn't matter. Sometimes you just need God. I don't know what this girl's issue was. I probably don't want to know. But you saw this happen a lot. You know, people were open about what they needed and what was going on. And, and it's powerful. That's powerful stuff. It really is. This is Dr. Dave. Dr. Dave is the same age as Carl. Dr. Dave has been doing this for 25 years for the program. He hasn't practiced in 20 years, but he keeps his license up so he can still buy pharmaceuticals for Hope for Hades children. Trust me, we walk in through the airport. I probably shouldn't say this on the internet, but <laughs> yeah, we smuggle a lot of stuff in and we just pay our way through it. And it happens because of him. Also, he sponsors a lot of people. And it was neat to see these kids. They would squeal when they'd see Dave and come running to him and hug him. This girl, sponsored by him, she made him a thank you card. You can see that. And this happened several times. This girl is now a nursing student because of his support. Here's another one that it was just so heartwarming to see. It really was. There was a lot of reunions. A lot of people get to see each other once a year. That They know each other. They support each other. And the love is just wonderful. This is the pharmacy. Um, yeah, it's nice traveling with the pharmacy, let me tell you. Anytime you want to travel to a third world country and have your own pharmacy, that's recommended. Oh, this man was uh, Bill, Bill Staggs. He um, used to own three pharmacists and sold them to like CVS or somebody like that. But he, he does nothing but charity work these days. Uh, he, he works with several groups. He was such a joy to talk to. He really was. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, this year we had Emily, and she's an ear doctor. She was there my first year. And it's nice to have kids, because they discovered a, kid, a couple of kids who needed hearing aids. And, of course, that would have never, ever happened. God is good. I love this photograph. This is the gift station. This is all the stuff that we take down there. This says a lot <laughs> when you look at this photograph here. Um, if you zoom in, oh, this is Rhonda. She's married to Ken, who is the president of Hope for Hades Children. She was there from the beginning. But if you zoom in a little bit, first of all, you can see this is the, uh, there was a sound booth at the congregation where Emily set up her, her hearing test. It was pretty, pretty slick to do it. But if you look down below, you see, this is all those deodorants that you guys gave me. They're right there, by all means. And if you look even closer, first of all, you see this smile on this girl's face. She knows it's about to be Christmas again because they're going to be set up with, with stuff, you know, school supplies and personal supplies from underwear to whatever. Whatever she needs, it's there. And it's kind of nice. But if you look right here, that's a suitcase that Norm gave me, what, two, three years ago? Three years ago, yeah. That's a suitcase that with his sons, and Norm gave me that. Um, they used it to store medical equipment now because it's a hard case. So that's, that's from here. And that's kind of cool. I thought, when I saw that, I went, oh, Norm's going to want to see that. It's very, that was your son's suitcase, right? Yeah. yeah, see, that's special. That's really cool, just to know that. This here is a breath of fresh air. I just walked into the most polluted, dusty, smoky air, and it felt so good. Because we're inside that building, and it is hot. I mean hot. I would go up on the roof to stand in the sun to cool off. It's 88 degrees outside. I don't know what it was, but that, this is a cool photo because it, it just, whoosh, oh, 
It felt so good to walk out and cool off. One day, when we thought we were going to leave, we heard a commotion outside, and this was outside. <laughs> yeah, this. This was some kind of Catholic procession that was right as we were starting to leave. This is looking one direction, and then this is looking the other direction. I don't know how many people there are. I'm guessing 30,000, but I don't know. There's no personal space. Remember, they pack them in. If it was Americans, it would be bigger because it, you're not you know, so close together. Um, but I love this here. This, I had to go get people and say, you have got to come see this. Because this was an amazing thing. This was what drove the whole thing. It was a big old semi with speakers on it. And they towed a generator just blowing it full bore behind them. And they were just talking and singing and chanting. I do have a little video. At the very end of this, I have three short videos that I can show you um, that it shows this. Um, I love this. This is before, and this is after. You know, quite a difference, huh? But they were peaceful. That's the best part. It was a peaceful protest. They were singing. They were praying. It was nice. Um, unlike the past year and a half, this has been going on. This is actually the view from the bottom of the hill looking up toward the church building. And of course, I did not take this picture. Um, it turns out all these protests, all these riots, all this stuff are staged, okay? The government, the senators didn't like the president. I don't know if they're senators, the members of the parliament. They didn't like the president. They couldn't vote him out, so what did they do? They started anarchy. They organized all of these riots and they hired these goons to make mob rule. And this happened all over the country, hoping that with anarchy, the president would resign. They hired these brutes to stir stuff up. Well, guess what happened? The president didn't resign. Also guess what happened? The senators didn't worry about their reelection coming up because they thought they would just start a political and start their own little government, they're gone because their terms ran out. So, instead, so right now the president is sitting in the White House and he doesn't have a Congress. He can't do anything. Talk about a messed up country. But that's, that's what will happen when the government gets out of control. All right. This is, uh, believe it or not, this is a driveway going to the Tomaso, uh, or the, the Cazo Orphanage. Uh, this is the Church of Christ there. It's beautiful. These are some of the kids. They still got their stickers on them. Oh, I'm sorry. They still got their stickers on them from the clinic. But this was the highlight. This was definitely a highlight of my trip. Um, I got to meet old friends. They know my name and I know their name. What you don't see, this little girl, see the little pink the little girl? She's trying to braid my hair. But this was really nice. Um, <laughs> this gentleman right here, Mel Bing, he took a lot of photos. There's a picture back there. Um, in fact, there's this picture back there. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures ever of Haiti, but he took it. I just handed him my phone and, and let him take it. So um, I gave him my phone, and I come back, and this label is stuck on, on my photo here. This is a, an orphan in Haiti who doesn't own a phone, and he can do stuff on my phone that I didn't know existed. I don't know how that happens. Just more... More friends. I really had a wonderful time. You can see I have some of the stickers from, from the girls. All right, on Thursday we got to go to the country, to Tomazo, way out of the country. It also, it rained. First time ever I had, it had rained when we were there and it cooled everything off. It was wonderful. But you always see so many different sights when you're cruising off into the country. This is somebody's house. They built sticks up against a wall. That is their home. Uh, they still, it's winter time, but there still is food to harvest. You know, the markets are, are working. Everything seems to be all right. This is a tap tap. This is how people get around. A tap tap or a bus or a motorcycle. They're called tap taps because when you want to stop, you just tap tap and it, the signal gets pushed up and you stop. The question came up, how many Haitians couldn't you put in a tap tap? The answer is always one more. All right. More countryside here. The country is kind of beautiful. It is hard to believe that this used to be a rainforest. Because if you look at Dominican Republic, it is totally a rainforest. But that's a long story, too. I love this place. 
This is, this is like on 40 acres out in the middle of, of the countryside. Um, this is where another orphanage is, Tamazo, and a, and a huge church. This church is growing like crazy. One Sunday in January, they had 13 baptisms. And, and, and one of them was John Luke, one of the orphans here. This is the orphanage here. This is the tour from on top. This is Ken Beaver, who was telling, they've been raising money for 10 years to get to this point to build all this stuff, and it is wonderful what they have done. Here he is giving the tour. They have summer camps for teenagers, Christian summer camps, and they used to rent a place. Now they don't have to rent a place. They can actually do it here because they've been building these buildings, and it's wonderful. Um, they have solar power. They have their own electricity. They have water. This is uh, the orphanage, the, the 12 orphans that are there. Like I mentioned, John Luke, he was just recently baptized in January. This might be my new favorite photo. There's a lot of love here. The lady that runs the orphanage, she is so humble. When you praise her, she only does it for the glory of God. Jesus is in her heart, and it shows. Those kids are so healthy. It's wonderful. This is the big room at the Church of Christ. That says, welcome to the Church of Christ, is what that says right there. But here's where I had my fun. This was the last day. We, on our final day, we saw almost 300 kids. And I was tired, but man, I was fulfilled. You know, when it comes to kids, I, I once had a hater ask me, you know, why do you like hanging out with children so much? Why do you like hanging out with little boys? I know what he was fishing for. But my answer, it was immediately, it was immediate, and it really made me feel good. I can never, ever wish anything bad on a child. Not a single child. And that, that alone has a freedom that comes that is, just feels so good. The innocence that I get when I'm hanging out around children, it is such a wonderful God's gift to me. All right, this is Mervin's. This is the kid that Christy and I sponsor. I'm so proud of this man. I walked through every aisle when I first got there, and I didn't see him. I didn't recognize him because... He has grown. This was him last year. I'm doing the same pose so you can see how height that it. He, he didn't smile. He had the scabby, so they had shaved his head. Um, he, I never saw him smile. I never saw any of his family smile. This is his little brother, Tony. This is his sister, Shislandi. You could tell they had that poverty stare. But now they've had a full year and a half in the program, and man, they smile. <laughs> it felt so good to see him. And he was just like a regular kid now. I was so happy. Here's his little brother, Tony, and his sister. She still got the attitude, but she was happy here. You could tell. It was wonderful. Check it out. One of the things he asked me last year for was bags to carry his stuff. I mean, what a selfless thing, bags to carry your stuff in. So look what he got. But he also got a soccer ball. He also got a hat. He got a bunch of stuff that, you know, I, I really set him up with. More kids. The kid on the left, that's Fednard. Fednard Cerulius. You guys sponsor him. We sponsor him as a family. Uh, every year we have done that. And yeah, he got a lot of stuff too. It was nice. Here he is again. And his photo. The very last day, remember at the very beginning I showed you that actual Caribbean scene. The very last day we took eight orphans who had never seen the ocean. We took them to the ocean. Can you imagine living on an island and they were probably eight miles from the ocean. They had never seen the ocean. So we took the kids to an ocean resort. I got on the bus, and on Mervin's, he just grabbed my hand. I was like, okay, I'm with you. We had a wonderful time. I mean, look at this. This was driving there. It was the first time I was like, I'm really on a Caribbean island. Because up to this point, I had been in Port-au-Prince, and I had been in the country. I had never even realized I was on an island. You just didn't. But that's me <laughs> in the water. I said, I'm, there's no way I'm getting in that water. You know, you always hear about New Jersey, Atlantic City, where they close the water because of a high bacteria count. Can you imagine what's in here? But those three kids that I'm with, they literally knocked me down and took off my shoes and said, you're getting in the water. So I couldn't resist, so I did walk in the water. <laughs> the little one holding my hand, he was terrified. He, he, would, he never let go. He did not like the water. But they also got a chance for a boat ride, which is pretty cool. They had never been on a boat. Um, 
but you know, life preservers, yeah, right. You know, certificate of insurance, right. Uh, I did say a prayer because none of these kids can swim. You know that. But they had never been on a boat, so I thought that was pretty cool. They even got in a pool. They had never done that before. You know, we went to a resort that was really happy to see us. You could tell they hadn't had any visitors for a long time. All right, look at that smile. Now, I told you about cold. They don't like the cold, right? Okay, we sat down for dinner, which was, was really special. Um, and there was a glass of ice, and I poured Mervin's water into a glass of ice and handed it to him. He grabbed that glass, and he pulled his hand back like he had been burned. And he did it again, and it, he did not like it. So he, he held, it, held it by the tip, and he tried to drink it a little bit. Oh, and he set it down. And then he basically, let's just pour it back into the bottle, okay? <laughs> he did not like the cold, which I'd, I'd never seen before. But we had a chance to, they had never had French fries they had never had ketchup. We got to show them how to eat french fries with ketchup. Little baby potatoes, but so what? It was really, really good. So you mix children and a day at the ocean in the water, guess what happens? They fall asleep on the way home. Mervin's was so sweet. He was sitting next to me, he looked up at me, and he gets up and he goes, sits next to a soft looking woman, puts his head down, he's done. Mervin's is no dummy. <laughs> He didn't want to lay in my lap. He knew better than that. But, oh, these precious angels. It was so cool sharing that with them, their first trip to the ocean. It really was. All right, so I get home. I feel bad for Christy. I've got 1,400 pictures like this I have to go through and process so I can give them back to the people who want them. You know? So I'm sitting at home just blasting through every spare time I can get. I had a lot of work to do, but... I'm just going through photos, just off and on, just reliving all these memories, all these kids, and it's just fun. We'll do a 10 at a time, I just blow through them. And I just love looking at these kids. Brand new guy, I can't wait to watch him grow up, Lord willing. But then, oh, wait a minute. Ah, then I hit this girl. Oh, and it just hit me. I just start bawling. This was one of those things that I'm a man, I saw something bad, I just tucked it away. I just threw it away. Then I saw her. Now, Monday morning, when we're working the clinic, this girl is standing at the registration desk. And you know the registration desk? I told you, it's right next to me. It's right here. She's standing at the desk, and she's just bawling. She's just crying. I know, Abby, I see the face. She is just crying and distraught. And I go ask, what's wrong? And Amy tells me, her name's not on the list. Her name is not on the list. Now, turns out she had snuck on the bus. Turns out she knew what awaited her if she could get on that bus. Now, Amy says, okay, this is not the way we do things, but if you can come back tomorrow with your birth certificate, we'll put you in the system. You'll be unsponsored, but I bet we can find a sponsor. So for two, she, she came back the next day, and she sat there for two hours right next to the registration desk because somebody was bringing her paperwork to it. And you know what? They showed up. So this girl, this girl knew what was waiting for her. And I could, <laughs> all I could think of, what's it going to be like if you're standing at the pearly gates and your name's not on the list? What's that going to be like? Because we know what's on the other side. We know what awaits us. So, yeah, that, that was one of those things that I went downstairs and Christy said, you've been crying? I was like, yeah. Because that was, that was really powerful. It really was. A follow-up. Some of you may remember two years ago I told you about these two guys. Um, Tanya went out to the well outside of the, the Tomazo just to see what was going on because when you put water, people come there. These two boys were sitting there. They had brought their donkey down from the, from the mountains to get water to take it back to mom. But they were sitting there just pounding rocks. Why were they pounding rocks? Because they didn't have any toys. That's what they did. So last year, Tanya got them in the program. This was them last year, which is really sweet. This was them this year. This is Job Jr., the older one. 
I recognized him immediately. It was so good to talk to him. Yeah, this, is his, this is his photograph here. Look at that smile. He's a year and a half in the program, man. He is so happy. This is his little brother, Tenor. Now, Tenor, he still got some medical problems. He still does. You can see, look in his eyes. There's something. But he looks a lot better, and he's in the right place. He's in the place that God needs him to be so he can grow up and be the leader that we're looking for him to be. Oh, man. On the way out to that resort, we drove by this place. Um, it's a memorial from the 12th of January, 2010. And it says, Aiti Pablai, Haiti will not forget. This is a burial ground for an estimated 200,000 to 400,000 bodies, souls. They really have no idea. It would just bring all the dead and we'll just throw them in a pit. They had no idea. There was such chaos 10 years ago. So, yeah, Haiti, I mean, I just, it's just hard to imagine that many people just buried in one spot. But what else were they going to do, you know, when it comes to it? They're all buried. You can see the fence right up in there. It's, it's also hard to imagine this used to be a rainforest. You know, it's just been stripped. I could tell you why, but we don't have time for that. Um, so here's, here's people who really love the Lord. I'm in that photo, actually. <laughs> I'm in there, too. I squeezed in. But this was a wonderful group. Being with a bunch of people who are mission-minded, single-minded, it is amazing. There's no conflict. Everybody knows what they got to do, why they're here, what they are. That, that is a wonderful experience that you guys have shared with me, and I really appreciate that. It is just wonderful. So that's really it. Um, I do have three really quick movies, if you would like. Um, that will get Brian to pop up. And they're like 25 seconds and a minute four, so I know I'm a little over, but I, I appreciate it if you guys want to see them. One is that, um, well, I'll just show you. There's always been a question of, why do you keep your hair long now? <laughs> You'll find out. Loves a hippie. <laughs> this happened dozens of times. All they needed was a chance. You might recognize this song. just to show you what greeted us outside one day. I'm 
glad that was peaceful. That's for sure. But um, I know one thing we've, I didn't spend as much as you guys contributed. Um, I know I helped with, a, I used frequent flyer miles to go from Miami to uh, Port-au-Prince, which is cool, that's easy. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'll, I need to get with the elders. Do I get to go back next year? Never. The Haitians do not take tomorrow for granted. Almost everything that they say starts with say bon die fi, which means Lord willing. They don't take tomorrow for granted. They, may, they know that God is involved. And I would say say bon die fi, I would love to go back. You know, I would love to, to, to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, in a way, it feeds my ego. It really does. Um, I had a chance to work with a lady. Who, I, I guess she was in, in the clinic and she watched me. She got to watch me for about a half a day. And she came up through an interpreter and basically praised my gentle spirit, you know, with the children. And my response to her was, I've been training for this my whole life. This is something I, it, it comes so natural to work with kids like, like this. And so it, to me, it, it's just really natural. So I would like to be able to go back. Um, I, one of the goals I would like to work on is I would like to be able to speak their language more. Um, you know, we have a little bit extra money. I'd like to spend that up maybe on a, on a language program that I could be more conversationalist to be talking about Jesus with these kids. Because I can talk to them a little bit now. Um, that's why I didn't need an interpreter, because I can tell them when I need to. But I, I would really like to be able to converse with them in Haitian Creole, which, you know, that's just something I would like to do. But do you guys have any questions? You know? Well, thank you. I know I ran a little over, but I, I appreciate it. And I, I thank you for letting me share something that has grown really, really important to me. Um, I can't believe I didn't choke up like I did this morning. But uh, yeah, this morning when I hit the steps, it hit me like, oh no, <laughs> as I walk up. But I, I got to figure I can't really apologize for being emotional because I'm just being honest. You know, the love of God, the love of Jesus is something we can get emotional about. And it does make a difference. I'm never going to change the government, but I can sure change this next generation coming up. One kid at a time. And I've seen it. I love it. And they're growing like crazy. You know, this year it was 150 more kids than last year. So it, it's a good thing to be. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. So good night. Oh, yeah, Norm? Uh, you go in the wintertime because it's not the rainy season. Uh, you don't do it during the summer because there's no school during the summer. So when well, that's cool, good idea. You know, uh, and also it's, it's a rainy season is during the summer a lot of times. So, so that's, we kind of go, I don't know why we go in January. Um, that's, it works for me. <laughs> you know? How do they get on the list? That's a good point. Um, basically, you have to ask. Um, you got you to gotta do something to... You know, be solicited to, hey, come over here. It's just, it's word of mouth, a lot of it is, um, how they would get on the list. But yeah, it's, you know, it's an amazing thing to have your name on the list. <laughs> it really is. And it's a powerful thing. So, yeah, thank you guys. Anybody else? I really, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I, I feel guilty in a lot of ways because I get so much out of it, but I try to give it back. You know, that's the whole idea. So, you have a question? Lord willing, I would love to go back. There's a lot, you know, a lot I can't control, you know. It could be my wife's health. It may not let us go back. You know, if that's it, that's the way it goes. I don't matter, you know. But um, I would love to. I would disappoint some kids if I didn't. But, you know, life goes on. So I would love to go back. Absolutely. You know, will you let me? <laughs> that's the whole idea because I can't do it by myself. But I, I think I represent you guys when I'm there. You know, I'm really proud to do that. Yeah, thanks guys. All right, thanks Brian.